is he we look, we look forward to okay. so before i begin let me ask a couple of questions um how many of you have heard of compressed sensing or have seen something in compressed sensing okay one how many of you have had a class in information theory nobody right so um i i want to give you two choices one is this talk on compressed sensing meets, meets information theory and the other is uh, um is a talk let me just find it this is more of a tutorial introduction to compressed sensing this is a, another aspect of compressed sensing and this has to do with uh, how uh, this is the role of sparse signal recovery in big data analytics so i mean these are your choices this is the same thing okay so these are your choices i mean um i came in uh, sort of uh, thinking that the audience might have some knowledge of either compressed sensing or information theory um i don't really require too much of either of the two but at least a little uh, passing familiarity with either one of these will help you follow the talk more easily um so i can stick with the original uh, title or i can go with one of these others okay so once again the your choices are the role of sparse signal recovery in big data analytics this is a tutorial introduction to compressed sensing and sparse signal recovery and this is compressed sensing meets information theory so let's do a show of hands how many of you want to see this talk okay how many of you want to see this talk okay and how many of you want to see this talk okay so this is the winner so we'll go with this one so this cuz this is going to be pretty raw because um, i hadn't planned on giving this talk so uh, i'm going to discover my slides as we go along and i'll explain what i understand to you okay but this will be an introduction to the idea of compressed sensing so this is the outline um i'll tell you a little bit about what compressed sensing means and then i'll talk about algorithms for sparse signal recovery then some kind of guarantees and then some other algorithms okay and then there are some applications i won't get through all of these i'll just go on till about uh, 45 50 minutes and then i'll stop okay so this is a one slide snapshot of the central problem that we are looking at in compressed sensing so how many of you have had a course in matrix analysis or matrix theory or linear algebra almost all of you so you know that linear algebra is all about just two equations okay one is y equal to ax okay and there you are usually given y and a and you have to find x okay the second equation what's the second equation we are interested in hmm no that is y equals ax when y equals 0 right so that is the same as y equal to ax what is the other equation exactly ax equals lambda x that's the eigen value eigen vector equation so those are the two equations we are interested in in compressed sensing we are we are still interested in the same basic equation y equal to phi times x there could be noise but noise i mean usually any measurement system will involve noise so if you are an engineer you want to look at the version which has noise in it what is the difference here the difference is that this vector you are trying to recover here is a big long vector compared to y which is your measurement vector so in other words you have many more unknowns so this is an n length vector okay and you have n unknowns and you have m measurements and uh, m is small is much smaller than n so if you go back to your linear algebra you'll remember that whenever you have such a system of linear equations it has infinitely many solutions okay that's because the null space of this matrix is non trivial so you take any solution to this equation so forget about noise for a minute take any solution to y equal to phi times x then take any vector which is sitting in the null space of phi and you add that to x that will also solve y equal to phi times x right because 
phi times that vector which is sitting in the null space is always 0. Of course, this system of linear equations could be um, uh, could have no solution which is the case when rows in phi in the phi matrix are dependent on each other okay. So, for example, if the first row and the second row are identical okay then you would expect that the first entry and the second entry of y must be identical. If they are different then it means that your system of linear equations are inconsistent and so you cannot find a solution. So, right off the bat we will eliminate that case and how would you eliminate that case? One very easy way to eliminate that case is to assume that this phi matrix has full row rank. Okay, you know that the rank of the matrix is at most the minimum of the number of rows and columns. Here this matrix has many more columns than rows, it is called a fat matrix and therefore, if I say that the rank of this matrix is equal to the number of rows, I mean that all the rows are linearly independent okay, and therefore, you cannot have an, have an inconsistent system of linear equations using this phi matrix. So, there will always be infinitely many solutions. So, given the system of linear equations from your, your, your knowledge of linear algebra, you can easily find a solution to this system of linear equations. How would you do that? You would do this thing called the pseudo inverse. How many of you are familiar with the pseudo inverse? Okay, only one. It is a very simple concept, I would not explain it here, but basically it involves taking phi transpose phi or in this case phi, phi transpose that will be an m by m matrix and then you invert it and then you do a little operation on y. There is a very simple linear equation. So, it is something like phi times phi phi transpose inverse times y that is actually a solution to the system of linear equations. Okay, it is as simple as that. So, it is easy to so find any one solution of this linear equation. So, the difference why this problem is relevant, why this problem is relevant today and why it is an interesting problem is because among all the infinitely many solutions, I want you to find the solution that has the least possible number of non-zero entries. So, among all those infinitely many solutions, I will evaluate how good the solution is based on how many non-zero entries it has and I want you to find the solution which has as few non-zeros as possible. This has a wide variety of applications, modern applications and some of them are listed here and they range in a variety of topics starting from signal representation which means basically how do you compress signals all the way to sparse channel estimation while the estimating wireless channels based on sparsity which is my area of research and time permitting I will re uh, refer to a little bit of this towards the end of the talk. Yeah, so this is an example in wireless, uh, I, I have a couple of examples here. This, this first example is on wireless channel estimation. So, if you have a transmitter and a receiver and you look at the wireless signal that is transmitted by the transmitter and which has to be decoded correctly at the receiver, what happens in real life is that the signal has one what is called a line of sight path. The, the signal coming directly to you from the base station to your mobile phone directly from the base station but it also bounces off buildings and automobiles and other vehicles and other things in the vicinity. So, there are multiple paths by which the signal arrives and what happens is that the speed of the uh, speed of light as it takes different paths is always the same and therefore, these signals do not arrive at the same time. So, if you look at what is called the impulse response of this wireless channel, the impulse response is like you send a blip out from the base station is something that goes to one very quickly and then comes back to zero. So, a small blip out from the base station, what you will see is multiple blips at the receiver corresponding to each of these different time delays. And what this does in turn is that instead of a blip, if you actually send a, an information carrying signal, you will essentially get multiple copies of that signal delayed by different amounts and added up together. So, that will actually just mess up every signal, every symbol that you are sending, right, because all the symbols are delayed and shifted and added up together. So, from that mess you have to figure out what was actually transmitted and the first step in doing that is to figure out what the trans, what the channel is doing to a single, single blip. So, in other words, you want to be able to estimate these different delays and what is the amplitudes that is being associated with each of the delays. And that is the problem of wireless channel estimation. Now, if you look at the this this the time from the time where the signal departs the base station to the time when you see the last signal path, 
that is usually referred to as the delay spread of the channel. And typically the delay spread of the channel can be quite long compared to the number of non-zero taps. That is you will only see three or four or six reflections. But then the delay spread across those reflections can be quite long. Okay. And therefore, when you look at it in time domain, if you think of sampling, you would sample this very finely in time. And when you look at the amplitudes at different samples, most of those samples will be zero. Okay. And some of them will be non-zero corresponding to the times exactly when you actually do receive paths. So then what you do in order to estimate such a channel is you send a known signal out from the base station. So for example, you pick your favorite pattern 10101010101 and you transmit this out from the base station. Because the receiver knows this pattern, it can use, it can see what the channel is doing to this known pattern and figure out what the channel is doing to an arbitrary signal. And um, there essentially what you get is a linear system of equations exactly like I showed you in the previous slide. And among all possible solutions of that linear system of equations, you want to find the sparsest solution. In other words, a solution that has as few non-zero entries as possible. And of course, one way to estimate this channel is you could send a very long sequence of known symbols. Okay. And if you send a very long sequence of known symbols, your, your system of linear equations will no longer be underdetermined like this. It won't be a fat matrix like this. It will be a square matrix. It could even be an overdetermined system. But the problem with that is you're sending a lot of known symbols, which means that you're using a lot of resources in order to learn the channel itself. Furthermore, in wireless communications, the channel doesn't remain fixed. It's not a static channel. It's a dynamically varying channel. So you only have a limited amount of time when the channel can be approximated as being constant. So within that time, you have to estimate the channel as quickly as possible so that you can actually use your channel estimate to decode data. So that is really the trade-off that you have to deal with in channel estimation. So this is the channel estimation problem and fundamentally the wireless channel estimation problem is a problem of sparse signal recovery. Okay. So this is the problem. So mathematically stated, what you want to do is you are given, so in the noiseless case when there is no noise, you, have, you are given the system of linear equations y equal to phi x. Among all the solutions of this linear system of equations, you want to find the solution that has the minimum, this is called the L0 norm. Okay. The L0 norm simply counts how many non-zero entries are there in a vector. So for example, if I give you a vector 1, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, okay, then it has three non-zero entries. So its L0 norm is just three. Okay. And um, also keep in mind that the L0 norm is actually not a norm. A norm has to satisfy a set of properties. For example, if you scale a vector c times x, then the norm of that vector must be equal to c times the norm of the original vector. Okay, that, that doesn't that is not satisfied here. You are simply counting the non, number of non-zero entries. So instead of 1, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, if I told you the vector was 2, 2, 0, minus 2, 0, or if I told you it is 2, 3, 0, minus 7, 0, all of these have the same L0 norm. Okay, so it doesn't satisfy this property which is called homogeneity. Okay, that's, that's a, one of the properties that a norm has to satisfy. It's not a norm. But in the literature, often this is referred to as a quasi-norm or, or simply as the L0 norm with the understanding that let's abuse notation a little bit and call it a norm. But nonetheless, you're looking for the sparsest solution to the system of linear equations y equal to phi x. If your measurements are not noiseless, you allow yourself a certain margin of error. This thing here, this two bars with a two underneath it is the Euclidean norm okay, or the L2 norm. It is simply the traditional length of the vector. So you take each component, square it, add it up, and then take the square root. That's the L2 norm. So you allow for a little margin of error. You, you, don't, you don't require that y and phi x must be exactly matched with each other. But among all such vectors where y minus phi x, the L2 norm is at most beta, amongst all such vectors, you want to find the vector which has as few non-zero entries as possible. Okay. So this is a problem in basic linear algebra, but this is a problem which is notoriously difficult to solve in practice. Okay, fundamentally, it's because there is a combinatorial nature to the problem. 
you have to so one simple brute force way of solving it is you would say suppose my x had only one non zero entry and suppose that non zero entry was the first entry okay then you would compare the first column of phi with your vector y if they are just proportional to each other then that proportionality constant is the coefficient i need with the first entry that will actually explain my observations so you have solved the problem but in case they are not proportional to each other if they are not collinear they are not pointing in the same direction then you have to drop the first entry and say maybe that's not the right one let's try the second entry okay and suppose the second entry was non zero then the second column of phi must match with y and so on so you try all the n entries suppose none of them work then what you have to do is to try the first two entries together okay then you will get a system of linear equations with two unknowns and m observations or m equations then you have to ask if this set of m equations are consistent so you you might remember this augmented matrix based way of finding whether a system of linear equations are consistent or not it can be done using the gauss elimination method right and so you do that and you figure out if the first two entries can explain your observation y if that fails try 1 and 3 1 and 4 1 and 5 up to 1 and n then 2 and 3 2 and 4 2 and 5 up to 2 and n so then you exhaust all n choose two combinations of entries that could be non zero so suppose none of them still satisfy your system of linear equations then you would look for three entries being non zero that in essence is the only way to solve the system of linear equations in such a manner that you are guaranteed to find the sparsest solution okay you can't do much better than this but you can see that computationally this can be very very challenging okay so n choose 1 is just 1 n choose 2 is just n square divided by 2 roughly speaking n choose 3 is of the order n cube but then as you keep going n power k can become very very large okay and so then you have to solve n power k systems of linear equations and see whether any of them explains your observations okay that becomes very expensive very quickly if you remember this um, old story about uh the, the this master at uh, chess and he wins a, a game of chess and then the king asks him so how how would you like to be paid and he says i just want one grain of uh, rice for the first chess board two grains of rice for the second chess board four grains of rice for the next and just fill up the table fill up the chess board for me and it turns out that uh, perhaps all the grain that has been grown from the start of when man started agriculture till today is not enough to fill up all 64 squares okay so it's the, it's something like that so that's what happens here exponential things that increase exponentially blow up very fast and so this is not solvable okay as it's as stated this is not a solvable problem so that is what is said here and the second thing is whenever you have noise it is uh, what we call not robust which means then what you would like in a in a in any system of linear equations or any solution in any engineering problem what you would like is that suppose there's a think of an engineering problem as a system which has an input and an output okay and the output is something that you are interested in input is observations or data that you have access to what you would like in any engineering system is that if you perturb your input a little bit instead of giving the same input you give a slightly noisy version of the same thing you add a small noise and and pass that as the input to your system the output must also be a slightly perturbed version of the output without in the in the first case okay that that is called that property is called robustness and any system that you design should be robust if adding a little noise is going to wildly throw away your system's uh, output then such a system is not robust and it's not desirable in engineering applications is there anybody who is not in an engineering discipline in this audience what is your specialization okay and you what about you are you in engineering yeah. didn't you raise your hand you didn't okay okay you are scratching your head okay just joking okay so uh, this is not not robust to noise okay so uh, 
So that was the state of affairs about uh, you know 10 years ago. And then there were a few very interesting breakthroughs that has catapulted this area into something which is uh, extremely, extremely hot, uh, extremely hot research topic today. And what were some of those breakthroughs? The first question you would, uh, you would want to ask when you are faced such a problem is that of uniqueness. So we've already seen that this system of linear equations, okay, has infinitely many solutions, okay. The very first question you might want to ask is what is the guarantee that the sparsest solution, that even the sparsest solution is unique. That is, suppose the sparsest solution had only one non-zero entry. What is the guarantee that at least that solution is a unique solution? Suppose, um, I mean, how do you know that there aren't two solutions which have both only one non-zero entry? Okay, if there are two of them, then you don't know how to choose. This, this problem is actually ill-posed. Uh, in mathematics, when we pose a problem, we want the problem to have a single solution. If it has multiple solutions, you need to find a way to choose which solution you are actually interested in. But right now, I have only said that the solution I am interested in is the solution that has the most or the least number of non-zero entries or the most number of zeros. If I give you that as the only criterion, but then there are multiple solutions which have the same number of non-zero entries, you have no way of choosing between them and that is an ill post problem. So the first result I can talk about is one which says, which talks about uniqueness. So let us say the measurement equation is y equal to bx and x has only k non-zero entries. A is a matrix which has m rows and n columns. In other words, x itself is an n length vector of which only k entries are non-zero and b is an m length vector. So the the first question you can ask is how small can m be? You can imagine that if m is too small, then I would potentially have multiple solutions which have the same, uh, same number of non-zero entries. So just as an example, consider that m is 1. So I give you only one equation, okay, and suppose k was also equal to 1. So that the, I tell you that the vector x is 1 sparse. If I give you only one equation, you can satisfy that one equation by making any entry of x non-zero, okay, provided the corresponding entry of the A matrix is non-zero because you have to divide by that coefficient in order to determine x, the corresponding entry of x. So for any non-zero entry in A, you can always find a solution. So there are exactly n one sparse solutions to a system of linear equations which has only one equation in it, okay. So the, in that case, it is not unique. So that is an example where it won't work. So the fundamental question is how small can m be? There are two ways in which people have answered this question. The first way is you fix this matrix A and you ask that you should be able to recover all possible k sparse vectors from, from B. And in this case, it turns out that m should be at least equal to 2 times k. So coming back to my example with only one non-zero entry, what this is saying is that if you want to be able to recover all one sparse vectors, you need at least two measurements, you need two equations. Loosely speaking, the way you can, you can, uh, you can understand this is that you need at least one equation to tell you the value of the non-zero entry, but you also need one more equation to validate among the n possible choices of the non-zero entry which one is the correct one, okay. So you need at least two equations. And uh, it, it can also be shown that there exists an A matrix for which this is also sufficient. So M equal to 2K is both necessary and sufficient for recovering all possible K sparse vectors from the measurement vector B. On the other hand, another view is you fix this vector X and you ask, let me try to find an A for which X is the unique K sparse solution. That is, there must be no other K sparse solution to this system of linear equations. And in this case, using slightly different arguments, and these arguments are probabilistic in nature, you can show that by choosing A at random, you can actually find an A with very high probability such that with just k plus 1 measurements, you can always recover x uniquely from, from B. So 
So the summary of this is that an underdetermined system of linear equations has infinitely many solutions, but it has a unique sparse solution if the null space has no sparse vectors. Okay, what the, what I mean by that is you remember I told you earlier that if you have this system of linear equations y equal to phi x and I find any one solution to this call it x naught. So y equal to phi x naught okay and then I find another vector x n which is sitting in the null space of phi then if I take the vector x naught plus x n right then that is also a solution to the same system of linear equations because phi times x naught plus x n is phi times x naught plus phi times x n but x n is sitting in the null space of phi so phi times x n is 0 so phi times x naught is y so phi so x naught plus x n satisfies this system of linear equations correct so that so now suppose that you have somehow found a sparse vector which solves the system of linear equations that is x naught is a sparse vector if you are able to find an x n which is sitting in the null space of phi which is also sparse okay then when you add x naught and xn you will still be left with a sparse vector in other words suppose uh, x naught is a k sparse vector it is a vector of length n but only k of its entries are non zero suppose xn is also a k sparse vector it is also a vector of length n but only k of its entries are non zero so if i take x naught plus xn at most how many non zero entries can it have 2k. So compared to n, 2k is still a very small number. So that is also a sparse solution to the system of linear equations. But if it can be ensured that any non-zero vector in the null space of phi has at least k plus 1 non-zero entries, okay, then when I add x0 and uh, x0 and xn, it can have anywhere from 1 to 2k plus 1 non zero entries okay because at the worst case the all the non zero entries might cancel out in the best case none of them may cancel out and you could get 2k plus 1 non zero entries okay using ideas like this you can show that this will this system of linear equations will have an, a unique solution with high probability if m is at least k plus 1. But the upshot of all of this is that you can show fundamentally that okay so let me maybe backtrack a little bit and make one other small point here. When I write y equal to phi x I can view that in a different way. The way I would like to view it is to say that I am compressing this vector x. I do not know what this vector is okay but nature has that vector x sitting somewhere and I am measuring it and the way I measure it is by multiplying x through this phi that is the measurement process. What I have in my hand is this vector y, y has only m entries in it, my original vector had n entries in it. If I had access to that x, if I had to, if I and I did not know which entries are going to be non-zero and I had to pre-allot data entries or data records for each of the non-zero entries in x, then if I allot b bits for a each entry in x, then if the length, the length of the vector is n, then I need b times n bits to store that vector x. But now through this measurement matrix phi, I am getting a vector y which hopefully captures the essence of x and y has only m non-zero entries. So if I again use b bits to, to denote each entry of y, I need only m bits, m times b bits to store y. So from m times n, I have come down to m times b and typically in, in these types of applications, you consider m far, far smaller than n. At, in essence, we are going to consider m to be of the order log n. Okay, And log n is actually something that grows extremely slowly with n. So for example, log of 10 is 1 log of 100 is just 2, log of 1000 is just 3, log of 10 power 10 is just 10. Okay, So think about where is b times 10 power 10 bits versus b times 10 bits. right? So the, the savings are enormous. So that is not possible if there is no uniqueness property. 
So this uniqueness property gives us hope that maybe we can get away with using only m measurements to store a vector vector x which is of length n. But uniqueness is not enough. We want to be able to also recover x from y. If you can't go back to x in a reasonable time, if it's going to take till the end of time for you to solve for x, then that's no point in there's no point in compressing it that much. So um, this is more on the uniqueness result. Um, I'm just going to uh, continue. Um, it's uh, uh, it's sort of re reiterating the same idea I already explained. Ah, so here's a simple numerical example just to illustrate the kind of things I've been talking about. So suppose you're given the system of linear equations. Uh, these are the curve. This is my phi matrix. It has three non-zero entries and B1 and B2. So if you look at this this matrix, you can easily check that any two columns of this matrix are linearly independent. Okay, nothing is proportional to the other column. Okay, and therefore any vector which is sitting in the null space of this matrix must have all three entries being non-zero. Okay, in other words, if B1, B2 was 0, 0 and if I asked you to solve this system of linear equations, it has a solution. In fact, it has infinitely many solutions. It, it's a one-dimensional subspace. Okay, give me a, if you give me one non-zero vector which satisfies A times X equal to 0, any constant times that vector is also a vector in the null space. It's a one-dimensional subspace. But the important thing here is that because all three columns are linearly, or any two columns of this matrix are linearly independent, all vectors in the null space must have, any vector in the null space must have all three entries being non-zero. Okay, so how do you prove that? <coughs> any two columns are linearly independent. That means that if let's say z was equal to 0, that means that if this must satisfy b1, b2 equal to 0, if it must satisfy this equation, it means that there is a linear combination x comma y of the first two columns which gets you to the 0 vector. But we've already argued that the first two columns are linearly independent. And therefore, the only x, y that satisfies x, y, z times this matrix equal to 0 is the all 0 vector. And so, you cannot have any entry of x being non-zero as any entry of x being 0 and this still satisfying a times x equal to 0. Okay. So, that is property number 1. Now, suppose b1 and b2 was equal to 1, then x equal to 1, 0, 0. Okay, so if this was 1, 0, 0, then you can see that 1 times 1, comma 1 will give you 1 and 1. And so that satisfies the system of linear equations. And we've already argued that any vector in the null space must have at least, must have all three entries non-zero. So if I take any vector from the null space and add it to 1, 0, 0, that must have at least two entries non-zero because I'm adding a vector which has all three entries non-zero to this vector. When you add zero to a non-zero quantity, it cannot suddenly become zero. It will remain non-zero. So any vector in the null space plus this vector will have at least two non-zero entries. And therefore, this vector 1, 0, 0 is the unique one sparse solution. There's no other one sparse solution you can find. Okay, but that is not true for all vectors x. So, uh, or for example, all, all right hand sides B. So, for example, if B1 equals 0 and B2 equals 1, you can check that there is no one sparse solution to it. It's very easy to check. Consider that the first entry is non zero, then ask, does it satisfy the system of linear equations? If the first entry was non zero, the vector you would get will be of the form 1, 1, some constant times 1, 1. And from that, you can never get a vector which is like 0, 1. Okay, anything you scale 1, 1 by will give you a vector which looks like a, a. It will not give you a vector which looks like 0, 1. Likewise, you can make this entry non zero and check that a scaled version of this can never give you 0, 1, something like 0, 1, etc. So it has no one sparse solution. It has two sparse solutions. But then if I add a, add a vector which has three non zero entries to a two sparse solution, I could end up with another two sparse solution. So there is no guarantee of uniqueness in that case. Okay. So the, the, the take home message from that is that 
not all right hand sides B will admit a one sparse solution. Only some very special B vectors will admit one sparse solutions. Here is another example. So there are three functions that are plotted in this uh, in, in this uh, in this slide. The first is a constant function. The second is a linear function. The third is a quadratic function. I sample these three functions at three points at minus 1, 0 and 2, okay. And uh, what I am going to do is I will not tell you which function I have sampled. I am only going to tell you I have sampled one of these three functions. And your job is to figure out which function I might have sampled. And the question is how many samples do you need? First of all, since there are three functions that I am considering and I have taken three samples, if I reveal all three samples to you, you can easily figure it out. Okay, so that's uh, if, if you if I if I reveal all these three samples to you, you can determine which function I sampled. That's not a difficult problem. That is equivalent to having three equations with three unknowns, and that can always be solved if the system is full rank. So that's not a difficult problem. So suppose I gave you the function values at minus one and zero. That is, I give you the red and blue points. Okay, I give you the red and the blue points. Is that sufficient? If I just reveal the red and blue points, can you determine which function I sample? If you look at this plots here, it looks yes or no? It looks like it is yes because you can look at those two samples and say if the two samples are equal, then I must have sampled this function. Okay, if one of them is zero. I mean the blue point must be 0 if it has to be one of these two. If the blue point is 0 and the red point is negative then it is the linear function. If the blue point is 0 but the red point is positive then it is the quadratic function. But I never told you that this is a positive quadratic nor did I ever tell you that this the slope of this function is always positive. This could be a linear function going down this way. This could be a parabola going upside down. Okay, So you cannot figure out which function I sampled by looking at just the red and blue dots, okay. But or, by a similar argument, if I reveal the blue and green dots to you, again you cannot distinguish between these two functions. But if I give you, so it seems like all three are necessary, but now let us say I reveal the red and green dots to you, okay. Suppose I reveal the red and green dots to you, the red is sampled at minus 1, the green is sampled at time equal to plus 2. Okay. Now I will argue that you can figure out which function I have sampled by using just these two points. You do not need all three points. Why? Because suppose the values were the same, okay, then it is this constant function. If the values, if you join the two values and it goes through the origin, if you join the two values by a straight line and it goes through the origin, then it is the linear function that I have sampled. If neither of them is true, it is the quadratic function that I have sampled. Of course, you can cross verify, you can validate that by checking that you solve for, so this is f of t equal to some unknown x2 times t square. So at minus 1, this value is equal to x2 and then at plus 2, it is going to be 4 times x2. So you can solve for x2 from both the red and green dots and see if they match. If they match, then that validates your solution. So by using the red and green dots, I can actually figure out which of the three functions were sampled. Okay, is this clear? Okay. So as I said, there are two things. One is, is it is the sparse signal recoverable or not? And the second thing is, if it is recoverable, how do you recover it? You obviously don't want these algorithms which take infinitely long to recover. So one looks for computationally efficient algorithms and there in the last 10 years there is a whole slew of algorithms that have been proposed and analyzed okay, with very deep understanding of when these algorithms work, when they will not work and how do you make them work better. Broadly speaking they can be classified in 3 or 4 different classes and I will now explain a little bit about these different classes. 
So the first in fact and the most simple algorithms are what are called sequential recovery methods. So when you think about y equal to cx, what is happening is a matrix times a vector, what when you may multiply a matrix with a vector phi times x, what you are really doing is you are taking different columns of the matrix phi, you are multiplying them with coefficients dictated by this vector x. So for example, you take the first column of phi, you multiply it with the first entry of x, you get different different vectors, you add up all these together, that is how you get your y. And now in particular, if the vector x had let us say one value equal to 100 and another value equal to 1, okay. So in other words, you are taking 100 times some particular column of your phi matrix plus 1 times some other column of your phi matrix, you are adding them together and that is your y. And suppose these columns are roughly have r roughly have the same norm, it does not have to be exact but loosely speaking, you do not have columns where one column is 100 times the other, okay. So in that case, when you look at y, you can imagine that it looks very much like one of the columns of phi matrix. So if you compare y with phi, because it is 100 times one of the columns, okay, you will find that y is basically very close to one of the columns in phi. So what you do is you take the inner product between y and columns of phi and you look at their magnitudes. You look at the column with which y is most correlated. You decide at that moment that that entry is going to be non-zero and you solve for that entry. In other words, you solve for the best possible coefficient which is based on what is called linear projections. So we that is actually a very simple operation so uh, and I will not go into the detail of that but you solve for the best value of that coefficient. Then what you do is you substitute that coefficient and subtract it out from y. So for example, if you found that y is most correlated with the first column of phi, you guess a value for x1 and you, then you construct y minus the first column of phi times x1. So that is called the residual. Now you compare the residual with columns of phi, but since you have already eliminated the first column, you do not have to consider the first column. You consider the remaining columns and you correlate this residual with all the columns of the second to nth columns of phi and you find the most correlated one. Compute the corresponding coefficient, remove it from the residual, you get a new residual. Proceed like this. So these are sequential methods for recovery. So uh, there are algorithms in this uh, class of, uh, uh, this class of recovery methods, they are listed here. Uh, they differ from each other in small details, some of them perform better than the others. So for example, in COSAMP, what you do is instead of finding the column of phi that is most correlated with y, you find a set of columns of phi that are most correlated with y. So for example, in each iteration, you pick the three most correlated columns and then the next time you add three more columns, etc. There is no, no requirement that you should pick only one column each time. So that is sequential recovery methods. Of course, the problem with such sequential recovery methods is what is called error propagation. So suppose you make a mistake and you pick the wrong column in the first iteration, then you will subtract the wrong column of phi from y to get a residual. So you have a wrong residual. So chances are that the next time also you will pick another in col incorrect column. And so this will cascade down your iterations and finally you will end up with a very wrong vector. So that is the problem with such type of re sequential methods. So people have also come up with joint recovery methods where you use some cost function that encourages sparse solutions and these are some algorithms in this direction. I will maybe talk a little bit about such methods uh, later. Um, yeah, so you would solve a problem something like this. I will explain this a little later. So in fact, this slide explains that idea. So the second breakthrough in compressed sensing which made this problem eminently solvable is that of relaxation. Okay, this is a very, very powerful idea. So pay a little attention and listen to what the idea is. The idea is as follows. Originally, I wanted to solve a problem where I wanted the sparsest solution. There was a zero sitting here. I wanted a sparsest solution to y equal to phi x. Now, 
I say that that problem is too hard for me to solve. So I won't solve that problem. Instead, I'll solve the problem of minimizing the L1 norm of x. What is the L1 norm of a vector? You take each entry of a vector, take its magnitude, add it up. So if I give you the vector 1, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, its L1 norm is 3. It happens to coincide with its L0 norm, but that is just coincidence in this case. Instead, if it was 2, 3, 0, minus 1, 0, then its L1 norm will be 2 plus 3 plus 1, which is 6. Its L0 norm is still 3. Okay. So the L1 norm is the sum of the magnitudes of the entries of x. So I ask, I say, suppose I solve this problem instead of solving my original problem where I was trying to find the sparsest solution to y equal to phi x. I have changed the problem. Okay, so why is that good? This is good because this problem is what is called as a convex optimization problem or it can be stated as what is called a linear program. So you will have to trust me on this that this problem is actually very easy to solve. What we mean by that in, um, uh, in, in terms of computations is that there exists a polynomial time algorithm. That is the time to solve this depends polynomially on the parameters of the problem which is m and n. Okay. So m is the number of rows in phi, n is the number of columns in phi. It depends on polynomial in, on m and n which is much better than something that depends exponentially in m and n. Okay. It can take infinitely lesser number of uh, amount of time to solve than for large m and n can take really, really much smaller time to solve. This is an eminently solvable problem. So that is good. I know I can solve this problem, but then I did not solve the problem of finding the sparser solution. So what good is that solution? That is where this breakthrough comes in. Amazingly enough, it turns out that under certain conditions, solving this problem will give you the same solution as the L0 minimization problem. Okay. So um, what is what are some of those conditions? An example is like this. If this measurement matrix phi was a what is called a random matrix and that is partly because the way you prove such a result is by leaning on tools from random matrix theory. Okay. So you use probability and statistics to show such results but if the matrix contains random entries. So an example of such a matrix could be a matrix whose entries are plus or minus 1 with probability 1 half. Okay, any entry of the matrix is either 1 or minus 1. The probability that it is equal to 1 is half. Probability that it is equal to minus 1 is also half. If, such, if you use such a measurement matrix and you use here it says slightly larger number of measurements that is because earlier I showed you some results on uniqueness which said you need something like k plus 1 non-zero entries but now we need slightly larger number which is m to uh, m is of, of the order k times log of n or log n over k. But as I already told you, log is something that really grows very slowly with n. So for instance, if, uh, if k is let us say 100 and let us say n is a million, okay, log of a million is just 6. In fact, log of n by k is just 4. So 4 times 100 is just 400. So in order to solve a system of linear equations y equal to phi x where there are a million variables in x, I only need about 400 measurements. Okay, That is what it is saying. So you have really compressed this vector x but still x is recoverable and what is more it is recoverable in polynomial time by solving this convex optimization problem. So and even better okay this is the icing on the cake is that this is robust to measurement noise that is if you perturb this vector y by a small you give me y plus delta y it will give you an x plus delta x where the magnitude of delta x is of the same order as delta y it won't wildly throw away your vector so to me this is actually perhaps the most important breakthrough in the area and this originates about this is about 10 years old this particular result is about 10 years old Okay, um, it was uh, uh, it was developed in a series of papers by some of these authors. Okay, and this this guy Tao here is uh, somebody called Terence Tao. Okay, he is a field medalist in mathematics, and uh, 
if you have time, I strongly recommend you go read his blog. It's very interesting. I don't know how this guy has the time to write so many interesting things on his blog. Okay, um, <coughs> but he's a he's he's a an absolutely brilliant mathematician. He's not a whole lot older than most of you guys. Okay, and uh, he came up with these results. Okay, so this is uh, this slide sort of gives you an idea about why. Uh, here I mentioned that I replace the L1 norm, uh, the L0 norm with L1 norm. This is a visual description of, uh, or to give you a little intu intuitive understanding of why that works. So, suppose I want to minimize mod x1 power p plus mod x2 power p subject to phi1 x1 plus phi2 x2 equals y. This is a system of linear equations with only one equation and two unknowns. So my m is 1 here and n is 2. I am doing that because that is all I can show you on, on a two dimensional plane. We cannot visualize more than three dimensions anyway. So if I had taken this x to be an n length vector, I would have to show you something in an n dimensional space which we do not know how to visualize. So. Um, this phi 1, so everything here is scalar, okay. This is just a number, this is a number, this is a number, this is a number, this is a number. So if I consider this phi 1 x1 plus phi 2 x2, um, suppose x1, x2 are my variables, so that is x1 and x2, then phi 1 x1 plus phi 2 x2 equal to y is a straight line, okay. In the two dimensional plane, it is just a straight line. Suppose it is this green straight line here. Now, as p tends to 0, Okay, any non-zero number power p will essentially tend to 1. Okay, any number power 0 is 1. By definition, 0 power 0 is 0. Okay, so if any entry is non-zero, when you take it to the power 0, you will get 1. So in other words, if p tends to 0, this is exactly my L0 norm of x. So now, let us consider a continuum. I start with a very small p and I increase p and see what is the problem that this prob what is what is this thing solving so for p less than 1 okay if i plot this thing called the equal cost contour that means all points on this blue line have the same mod x1 power p plus mod x2 power p what i am essentially doing is i take this bubble okay with equal cost and then i am expanding that bubble and trying to see where does it first meet this green line here. But because the equal cost contours have this inward diamond type of shape, as I expand that bubble, you can see that it is extremely likely that this inward bubble will only meet it at one of the axes. Okay. And because it meets it along the axis, only one entry of this, so here in this case, for example, x2 is equal to some non-zero quantity, but x1 is 0. So the point where it meets it with minimum cost is going to be a point where only one entry is non-zero. On the other hand, if I take p greater than 1, these equal, so for example, if p equals 2, it says mod x1 squared plus mod x2 squared. That is a circle. So then my bubble is actually a circle. I am taking a bubble which is of the shape of a circle and I am blowing that up and asking when does it first meet this line. And you can see that in this case, unless the line has some very special properties like it is parallel to one of the axes, chances are that it will meet the bubble, the bubble will meet the line at a point where both the entries are non-zero. Okay, so if you if p is greater than 1, in general, it always leads to non-sparse solutions. p equal to 1 is a sweet spot in between, it is a very special case. In this case, the bubbles are diamond shaped. And you can see that in this case, it is still quite likely that you will meet it at a single point. But then, if your line happens to be of at 45 degrees, then it will meet it anywhere here and any point along this line is a feasible solution with the same L1 norm. So there are multiple L1 norm solutions. But un, uh, other than those pathological cases, in most cases, it will actually meet it at a point. But then when p equals 1, the interesting thing is that this problem is convex, so it is eminently solvable. So I have this happy situation where y equal to phi x is not only solvable, but also 
I can get the sparsest solution. Okay, so what I mean is so by solvable is not only solvable in polynomial time, there exists a computationally efficient algorithm which will also give me the sparsest solution. So the problem that was that we started out with and described and I told you that this problem is combinatorially hard can under certain situations like the conditions I listed here, it can actually be solved and this is the basic idea of compressed sensing and this has been explored a lot since that time in the literature. So I think this is a good point to stop. Um, I can't get through the rest of my slides anyway. So I will stop here and ask if you have any questions. I can go on for, I teach a whole semester course on this. So I can, I can go on for the next uh, 40 hours if you want me to. Yeah, please. You mean um, here? So what do you mean by a resource? <laughs> Applications. So what I wanted to say here is that if you could find a way to solve this problem, okay, it can be useful in all of these applications. Okay, and I showed you actually a, a, two or a, a couple of ways of solving that problem which will give you the sparsest solution and that is useful in all of these applications. In other words, if you know how to solve that problem, people working in all these areas will be interested in your solution. Okay, somebody taking, so just to give you an example. In medical imaging, okay, taking an MRI, how many of you have uh, interacted with somebody who has gone through an MRI or had an MRI yourself? So you know that the way to take an MRI is they basically put you in a tube, right? You have to go into a, a closed enclosed space and you are asked to sit absolutely still or not asked to lie down absolutely still for about 15 or 20 minutes till they take their measurements, okay? And while you are li lying there, you have a lot of loud sounds like gunshot sounds, okay. It is actually not a very pleasant experience. If you knew how to solve this problem, you do not need that many measurements. So instead of a 20 minute sit in through that inside that tube, you can actually manage with something like a 2 minute sit in the tube, okay. So that significantly reduces patient discomfort. And economically also it is a very important thing because this, these machines which take MRI images cost several crore rupees. And if you can only take, I mean pass one patient through this machine in 20 minutes and there is some prep time and a downtime associated with, the, with each measurement. So if it takes 20 minutes in an hour you can take, a, you can at most uh, take the MRI images of only 3 patients. So that limits how many patients you can see per day which in turn implies it is going to be very expensive for a given patient to get an MRI taken. If you can reduce it down to 2 minutes, you can have 10 times as many patients going through the machine. The cost of the machine is the same, okay, and the power consumed by it is the same. So the cost of an MRI can actually come down by a factor of 10, okay. So if you know how to solve these problems, it has very important ramifications to how medicine is practiced. This is just an example in, in medicine, but there are many other examples as well. Yeah, so the, the conditions for L1 recovery to succeed are actually stronger than the conditions that L0 recovery will succeed, you will get a unique solution. So the uniqueness is actually subsumed in the conditions required for L1 uh, recovery to work. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Professor Murthy for accepting our invitation and coming and giving a talk. There is a small token of appreciation for what